Hello, YouTubers, friends, compatriots. Blue Liquor Shield Tesla Search Presents Vassals, Butlers, Smedley Butlers, Snidely Whiplashes. I'm a useful idiot, and today I want to talk about Smedley Butler, perhaps the greatest whistleblower in American history. In fact, he might be one of America's greatest Americans in history, certainly one of America's greatest soldiers in history, and an unbelievable character. So if you haven't heard about Smedley Butler, you better hold on to your hats, because this is quite a story. And this will be a long one, because it has to be. This man led an incredible life that is truly beyond belief. They, they couldn't even possibly make a movie about him, because he has just done too much. And uh, here's a picture of old Smedley Butler. And uh, he's a hero of mine, so I, I happen to have a frame picture of him around because uh, what a guy. And he's also, for all you gentlemen out there, happy Father's Day. And we're talking about a man's man's man. So, uh, like I like to say, let's, uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. So he enlisted in the Army at, at 17. And uh, let me say right off the bat, before I go through this, he went through every single military campaign the United States was involved with at the turn of the century, so the very dawn of American imperialism. He was on the cutting edge, and he has been everywhere in the world, so let's start again. At 17, he enlisted and uh, was in the Spanish-American War. And in fact, he landed in Guantanamo, Cuba, the irony of that. He, he landed in Guantanamo, Cuba in 1898. And then not only that, in 1899, he was in the Philippines War. So in, during the Spanish-American War, the United States occupied Philippines, and then like in many other situations, we became the occupiers of a country that wanted its independence. So we ended up fighting the Philippines. So uh, Smedley Butler was in on that. And then he went to China in 1900, and he was there for the Boxer Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion was when the European powers and the United States and Japan had divided up China into districts, and there was a uh, rebellion by a certain uh, sector of Chinese society that year in 1900, and the uh, uh, foreign powers ended up having to put down an, an insurrection inside China, a little known fact for some people. Um, by the 1900s, he was uh, working in the banana wars in the Caribbean and Central America, representing corporate interests all throughout South and Central America. And uh, then in uh, 1903, he was in Honduras, and that was uh, to defend the U.S. consulate that was under attack. So that uh, has a little ring of deja vu, doesn't it? We send troops to defend an American embassy in Honduras. Then in 1909, in 1912, he was in Nicaragua, where he was uh, defending American corporate interests. Then uh, it does just does get any wilder. It does get wilder. In 1914, he was on a spy mission in Mexico. And uh, he was trying to map out for a possible invasion. And uh, the United States almost invaded uh, Mexico in 1914. But uh, in 1914, uh, Smedley Butler landed in Veracruz, Mexico with 6,000 Marines for an intervention there. And um, in 1915, he was in Haiti. And uh, when he was uh, dealing against uh, Cow Cow rebels in Haiti in 1915, he said that, quote, they hunted the rebels like pigs, unquote. Then uh, when World War I began, he requested a uh, combat mission in 1917. He got a command on the Western Front in 1918. He's a brigadier general at, 19, at the age of 37, very young, and stationed in Brest, France. Then in 1927 and 1929, he led a Marine Expeditionary Force in China. Um, then in 1929, 1930, oddly enough, he was in the United States um, taking uh, huge amounts of Marines, thousands of Marines, and doing Civil War reenactments at places like Gettysburg, um, using thousands of Marines. Pretty must have been quite a sight. And here's where, this is where he gets persecuted by the government, and he spends most of the 30s being persecuted by the government, because he spoke, in 1931, he spoke publicly about Mussolini being involved in a hit and run, where the child was uh, killed, and uh, President Hoover ordered him to be court-martialed, and instead he ended up apologizing to Secretary Adams, and uh, his court-martial was canceled, but uh, this is the first general officer
to be placed under arrest since the Civil War. So uh, his outspokenness uh, gained him some enemies. And then uh, in 19, through the 1920s, he ran the police and fire departments in Philadelphia. And he ra organized raids on 900 speakeasies, speakeasies and uh, uh, propagated a police war on bootlegging, prostitution, gambling, and police corruption. So it wasn't enough that this guy was involved in all these uh, foreign wars in the United States and exotic jungles all over the world. Now he's in the middle of uh, gangster and mobster wars in the 1920s during Prohibition. So once again, uh, can you imagine a more um, exciting life than the one this guy has, has led? So then in 1931, he, he retired and he, he ran for Senate unsuccessfully. And he lectured and he mostly went around um, speaking out against uh, war profiteering, U.S. military adventurism, and nascent fascism. So once again, he uh, becomes a whistleblower. So um, this is the second major time, and you can imagine the government being uh, outraged by him talking about U.S. military adventurism, war profiteering, and, and nascent fascism in the United States. Whoa, here we go with a little deja vu again. So as always, history shows us that uh, every, uh, we need to learn something, and it's always relevant, particularly in context. So we have a whistleblower from 100 years ago who whose standard has yet to be met in our future time. In, present, in our present time, <laughs> our future, future is already here. So then in uh, 1934, um, 1931, the Bonus Army marched on Washington, D.C., or 1932, and 43,000 uh, ex-veterans from World War I marched on Washington. And they'd been promised a bonus that was going to be redeemable by 1945, but in the midst of the Depression, they wanted it now. And so they marched on uh, Washington, D.C. And initially, two protesters were killed, and uh, eventually the crowd was charged by cavalry and gas. And oddly enough, Smedley Butler was on the side of the Bonus Army, and his uh, adversaries were General MacArthur and Patton, um, who put down the Bonus Army um, march. And uh, then between 1935 and 1937, Smedley Bar Butler was part of the American League Against War and Fascism. And um, the uh, most famous episode, and this, here's another, here's the third great episode of Smedley Butler being the king of whistleblowers, is in 1934 he revealed the business plot, a political corporate conspiracy of Wall Street interests to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt and set up a dictatorship under General Hugh S. Johnson. And they were all Nazi sympathizers, the, the likes of Dow Chemical, and even uh, Prescott Bush, um, George W. Bush's grandfather, was involved in this plot. So there's a lot of interesting footnotes to this story. And uh, the business plot was to get the private army of 500,000 disgruntled veterans to watch, uh, walk, march on Washington, D.C. and uh, topple the government. And uh, $3 million was uh, put towards this, which was a lot of money then. And the media dismissed it as a crazy conspiracy, as a lot of them were in on it. And a final report from the government proved that it was all true. So it's all very documented. So, uh, so Smelly Butler died in 1940. And, um, of course, is uh, unrecognized by the United States government anymore because he was a whistleblower. And he was critical about the ways U.S. business and Wall Street bankers imposed their agenda on United States foreign policy during the turn of the century wars. And uh, once again, sounding all too familiar. And uh, <laughs> there's some great um, uh, anecdotes about him. Um, during an exercise in West Virginia in 1921, he was told by a local farmer that Stonewall Jackson's arm was buried nearby. So he brought some Marines, and they actually dug it up and found it. And he later replaced the wood box with the metal one and reburied it. And there's a monument and a plaque there. So this actually happened. And then uh, he also has uh, three medals of honor, which is unheard of. He has a tattoo from his throat to his waist of an eagle, a globe, and an anchor. And uh, in his early days, he was quite a heavy drinker. And uh, he had a couple of uh, nicknames. One was Old Gimlet Eye because he was always feverish and bloodshot. And another one was Old Duckboard. And um, they, they don't come much wilder than this. And he condemned 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt for ties to big business, which sounds uh, familiar. And uh, he was noted for an article he wrote called, You've Got to Get Mad. And he said, quote, I believe in taking Wall Street by the throat and shaking it up, unquote. And then uh, in 1935, he wrote his masterpiece, War is a Racket, where he explains everything he know, knew about uh, working with corporate interests overseas using the Mar American military, which is a practice we still have today. So this is all relevant. And uh, he incidentally, in, in, in that book, he also attached a lot of uh, gruesome photos of uh, war wounds from World War One, And uh, it's quite horrible. So he really wanted people not to be thinking about war as an option. And um, he spoke out against uh, war profiteering, U.S. military venturism, and uh, nation fascism, like I said. And uh, he also had a goal of educating soldiers, quote, out of the sucker class, unquote. So he wanted soldiers to be educated so they wouldn't find themselves in the position that uh, he's been in. And uh, I'll finish up with a quote that he had that makes it all clear and why his own government feared him as the ultimate whistleblower in American history. Smedley Butler said, quote, I spent 33 years in active military service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico safe for oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for a national city bank. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for international bankers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for sugar interests in 1916. I made Honduras right for U.S. fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped Standard Oil. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. But Al Capone only ran three districts. I ran three continents. And so, some things never change. My hat's off to Smedley Butler, perhaps the greatest American who ever lived, the greatest hero who ever lived, the greatest soldier who ever lived, and the greatest whistleblower who ever lived. I'm a useful idiot. Don't you be one too.